Hello, students, and welcome back to History of Sexuality. This week in class, we're going to turn our attention to the United States and to the construction of modern America's sexual binary. According to many historians, homosexuality as we know it today came into existence during the late 19th century, a period when doctors and psychiatrists began thinking about sexuality more in terms of object choice than in terms of gender performance. With this transition emerged a binary between heterosexuals and homosexuals. Yet, according to Margot Kennedy, author of the award-winning book The Straight State, Sexuality and Citizenship in 20th Century America, the invention of heterosexual and homosexual species was accomplished not only by the medical profession, but also, and crucially, by federal bureaucrats. Focusing on the state, Canada argues that modern American homosexual and heterosexual identities were largely a product of legislation and policymaking, especially in the military, in immigration services, and in federal welfare programs. In her book, which we're going to explore this week, Canada identifies the mid-20th century as a particularly critical moment. World War II was of particular importance, as it was at this point, during this military conflict, that the U.S. government began to functionally divide the U.S. population into homosexuals and heterosexuals. One place where this binary was inscribed was in federal citizenship policies, hence the subtitle of Canada's book, Sexuality and Citizenship. As Canada has it, in the mid-1940s, the U.S. began to actively and deliberately exclude homosexuals from certain rights and benefits of citizenship, which was increasingly understood and practiced in terms of sexuality. In our second video lecture of the week, I'm going to get into the details of the story that Canada lays out in her book. But before getting to this, I want us to explore this idea of sexual citizenship a bit. This is a term that's become quite popular of late, as we see it both in academic monographs and journal, journal articles, in news media discourse, and in various areas of pop culture as well. What is sexual citizenship? Where did this concept come from, and what is it meant to connote? How useful is it for understanding the formation of sexual identities and for analyzing the relationship between sexuality and politics? And how might we use this as a tool for reconstructing the past? These are the questions I'd like to start addressing in this lecture. In recent years, there has been an explosion of historical research on citizenship. Much of this work attempts to uncover how citizenship was conceived of and practiced in the past, asking, for example, what the attributes of a quote-unquote good citizen were thought to be in any particular era, or looking at how states have historically bestowed certain rights on people as a condition of citizenship, or deprived them of these. In addition to looking at citizenship in terms of rights and status, Historians have also examined the obligations of citizenship, exploring the various duties owed to the state on account of one's membership in a national community. One of the key insights from all of this work has been the discovery that citizenship practices are often simultaneously inclusive and exclusionary. That is to say, the historical trajectory of citizenship has not simply been one of continual expansion, but also one of restrictions, boundary making, and the creation of non-citizens or anti-citizens. Those declared ineligible for citizenship have sometimes been formally expelled from their countries of residence, 
At other times, they have retained rights of residence, but simply been denied the rights granted to full-on citizens. In the words of political theorist Lisa J. Dish, otherness is imminent to citizenship. Citizenship fosters differentiation and the making of legal and socio-political hierarchies, because in historical cases, some people are incompletely incorporated into citizenship in a way that demonstrates their subordination or their degraded status. The fact that citizenship practices are exclusionary has long been known. Decades of feminist scholarship, for example, have demonstrated that from its very origins as a concept, the idea of the citizen was a highly gendered thing, something designed to prevent women's full inclusion in the body politic. In ancient Greece, for example, citizenship was thought to require the transcendence of the body and its appetites, things that only men, as the rational sex, quote unquote, were thought to be able to do. As sexual beings and bearers of children, Women, on the other hand, were not thought to be capable of overcoming their physical natures. Far from it, they were imagined to be in need of masculine protection. Thus, citizenship came to be identified with the public realm, and because women were said to inhabit the private realm of the home, they were declared categorically ineligible for citizenship. Women's roles in private life thus created barriers for opportunities in the public sphere and for the bestowing of citizenship and its benefits. Over time, women's struggle for inclusion has led to things like female enfranchisement and the overturning of laws that bound wives to the will of their husbands. Yet, even today, women in many countries around the world live as second-class citizens. Another key insight from the contemporary scholarship on citizenship is the idea that citizenship is increasingly being defined in terms of our activities in private. Traditionally, citizenship has been thought of in terms of the public sphere, that is, in terms of things like voting, holding political office, working, serving in the military, etc. Now, however, it seems that with the passage of time, contemporary governments all across the world are defining citizenship in terms of everyday things that people do in their homes and in their private lives. For example, in many Western countries today, the quote-unquote good citizen is said to be one who takes care of their body through healthy eating practices, through regular exercise, and through practices of safe sex. Along with health citizenship, there has increasingly been discussion of sexual citizenship and of the ways in which modern states determine access to rights and resources on the basis of sexuality. So to what extent is citizenship dependent on sexuality? Specifically, how has membership in national communities been associated with the institutionalization of heterosexuality. So how could sexuality, you might ask, be a determining factor in the allocation of the rights and obligations associated with citizenship? Recently, scholars have come to realize that citizenship is often built on heterosexual norms that have historically been used to deny sexual minorities access to national resources and rights. In some parts of the world, for example, homosexuality is illegal, leading to a situation in which gays and lesbians are denied basic civil rights. In countries where homosexuality is legal, there nevertheless exist barriers and obstacles to full citizenship. For example, there are laws that prohibit gays and lesbians from serving in the military, which is traditionally an incubator of citizenship. There are also laws that prevent them from marrying 
and from partaking of all of the economic and social benefits that come through the institution of marriage. There are also laws that allow for discrimination in terms of employment, housing, and other areas of life, and that also allow for harassment from individuals, companies, or state institutions. Many countries today lack specific legislation against hate crimes committed against sexual minorities, and this lack of access to equal protection under the law demonstrates one of the ways that citizenship is sexual in nature. Instead of being incorporated into full membership within their respective polities, gays and lesbians have historically been seen as threats to national security and to the national community. In some cases, this othering of homosexuals as enemies of the state stems from the idea, the alleged idea, uh, that gays and lesbians reject the heterosexual imperatives of citizenship, which are seen to require procreation and the perpetuation of heterosexual family institutions. The term sexual citizenship captures all of these intersections of state power and intimate life. The term itself was invented by queer and feminist scholars whose works demonstrated ongoing patterns of exclusion in citizenship practices and was built upon the observation that modern-day nation-states are in many ways heterosexual regimes. This scholarship built upon earlier work documenting the racial and gendered aspects of contemporary citizenship policies and pointed out how modern-day countries tend to distinguish the sexual citizen from the sexual stranger, the sexual stranger being someone whose personhood is not acknowledged and who is not accorded full membership in the national citizenry. These scholars wanted to criticize the idea that heterosexuality should be an essential component of citizenship. They also wanted to fight back against sexual regulations that made non-heterosexuals into second-class citizens. If part of the point of normative heterosexuality is to channel sexuality into the institution of heterosexual marriage, they wanted to practice what was sometimes called dissident sexual citizenship. From this work, we've come to see how discourses of heterosexuality have powerfully informed and shaped the historical construction of citizens and non-citizens. Although states like to see themselves and portray themselves as asexual, uh, this research has demonstrated that states are actually sexualizing powers, that is, entities whose practices, especially around citizenship, are strongly shaped by sexual ideologies. Instead of being indifferent to sexuality, states actually promote and produce various forms of sexuality and are part of the reason that we have the homosexual, heterosexual binary today. All right, at this point, I think I'd like to pause and posit some questions for critical reflection. First, I'm wondering what you make of all of this scholarship. Would you agree that in the contemporary world, citizenship is increasingly configured through sexuality? What do you make of the notion that 21st century nation states are heterosexual regimes that practice heteronormativity and actively seek to exclude sexual minorities from full, partic full participation in the life of the national community? And what do you make of this idea of dissident sexual citizenship? Once you've had a chance to think through and about some of these things, please head over to our discussion board and share some of your insights. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to say, and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye for now.